Hello and welcome to Earth Science, Lecture 24, Climate Change, Part 1. Although climate has a significant impact on people, we are learning that people also have a strong influence on the climate. Climate change is a hot topic today. Unfortunately, it is a topic that has taken center stage in political debates. While it is great that we are at least having the discussion, I feel that many people are still generally uninformed as to how climate works and or why it is so imperative that we do something about it as soon as possible. Here, in these th uh, this three-part lecture, we will discuss how the greenhouse effect works, what lessons we can learn from our neighbors, the history of sensitivity of Earth's atmosphere, and the effects that we humans are having on the world. This lecture was created with the sole purpose of distributing knowledge of the subject so that you, the reader or listener, may make more informed decisions when it comes to debating, voting, and your everyday life. So let's jump in and start with this. Now, I think if you have taken my course or if you're um, following along in these lectures, you've seen this image already, but I want to bring it up again. Life as we know it would be impossible on Earth without our atmosphere. This layer of gas supplies the oxygen that we breathe, it shields us from harmful ultraviolet and X-ray radiation from the sun, it protects us from the continual bombardment of micrometeorites, it generates rain-giving uh, clouds, and it traps just enough heat to keep Earth habitable. As mighty as this may make our atmosphere sound, however, it is both remarkably thin and fragile. To give you an example, an average apple is about 225 millimeters around, and its skin is about 3 millimeters thick. If we compare the Earth and its atmosphere to an apple and its skin, the skin of an apple is about 20 times thicker relative to the size of the apple than the atmosphere is to the Earth. You could also make a representation of this uh, using a standard classroom globe, so think of any globe you've seen, uh, and if you put a dollar bill on top of the globe, that's roughly how thick Earth's atmosphere is compared to the Earth. To understand and appreciate climate, it is important to realize that climate involves more than just the atmosphere. Indeed, we must recognize that there is a climate system that includes the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the geosphere, the biosphere, and also the cryosphere. Note that the first four of those spheres were discussed previously in this course, but the cryosphere refers to a portion of the Earth's surface uh, where water is in solid form. The climate system involves the exchanges of energy and moisture that occur along the five spheres. These exchanges link the atmosphere uh, to the other spheres to form an extremely complex interactive whole. Changes to climate system uh, do not occur in isolation. Rather, when one part of it changes, the other components respond. Climate has a profound impact on many of Earth's external processes. When the climate changes, these processes respond. And so this graphic here that you see just shows many of the different interactions that our uh, climate has. So let's start out with some review if you've taken my course, or just some solid background information to get us ready to understand how climate change is working. So you've probably heard of the greenhouse effect, because it is an important part of the environmental problem known as global warming. But you may be surprised to learn that the greenhouse effect is also critical to the existence of life on Earth. Without the greenhouse effect, Earth's surface would actually be too cold for liquid water to flow and for life to flourish. So let's explore how the greenhouse effect can warm planetary surfaces. Very little heat comes from inside our planet. So the average surface temperature of Earth depends almost entirely on the amount of energy that reaches us from the sun. If Earth did nothing but absorb radiation from the sun, it would continually get hotter and hotter until the surface temperatures became hot enough to melt rock. Thankfully, this does not happen. One reason for this is the fact that clouds, snow, ice, and sand, for example, reflect about 31% of the incoming sunlight back into space. The fraction of incoming sunlight that a planet reflects is known as its albedo, which is a Latin term for whiteness. Note that a planet's reflectivity depends on its composition and color. 
In general, darker colors reflect less light. As you can see in this figure, surfaces such as asphalt and dark rooftops will reflect very little light, anywhere between 5 and 18%. Whereas a much whiter surface, such as that provided by snow-covered ground, reflects a significant amount of solar energy, anywhere from 80 to 95%. The energy that is not reflected, that is, the other 69%, is therefore absorbed, efficiently heating the surfaces. The Earth happens to be warmer than what is predicted to be as caused by the Sun's radiation alone. The explanation for this discrepancy is called the greenhouse effect. Our atmosphere uh, prevents some of the infrared radiation emitted by Earth's surface from escaping into space. Certain gases in our atmosphere, known as greenhouse gases, among them being water vapor or uh, carbon dioxide and uh, so on, they are transparent to visible light but not to infrared radiation. As a consequence, visible light has no trouble entering our atmosphere and warming the surface. But the infrared radiation coming from the heated surface is particularly trapped by the atmosphere, thus raising the temperatures of both the atmosphere and the surface. So let's take a look at a graphic of how this works, and we'll step through this once more uh, with a graphic. So how does this work exactly? Well, sunlight first arrives at the Earth, as you can see by the yellow arrow. Roughly 31% of sunlight is immediately reflected back by clouds and the surface but the other 69% is indeed absorbed by the surface. This heats the surface. Well, the now heated surface then emits thermal radiation or infrared radiation. That is, it's a warmer surface, so if you used a thermal camera or something, you would see it glowing slightly. Uh, so some of this radiation leaks back into space, but the rest is trapped by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, heating both the atmosphere and the surface below. The net result is that the greenhouse gases tend to slow the escape of infrared radiation from the lower atmosphere, while their molecular motions heat the surrounding air. In this way, the greenhouse effect makes the surface and the lower atmosphere warmer than they would be from sunlight alone. The more greenhouse gases uh, pre present, the greater the degree of surface warming. All of the energy, quote, trapped by the greenhouse effect does still eventually escape into space. It's just not as directly as it would be otherwise. A blanket offers a fantastic analogy. I use this all the time. You stay warmer under a blanket, not because the blanket itself is providing any heat, but because it slows the escape of your body heat into the cooler outside air. So, for example, if you add in more layers on top of you while you're sleeping, you're probably going to feel warmer. Well, same with the atmosphere. The more at, uh, greenhouse gases you add into the atmosphere, the more blankets you're adding, and so the more heat that we trap. So the warming caused by the greenhouse effect gives our planet the moderate temperatures needed for the existence of life today. For more than a century, however, our technological civilizations have been adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere at an unprecedented rate. We can better appreciate the importance of the greenhouse effect by comparing each planet's average surface temperature, or global average temperature, with and without the greenhouse effect. Recall that a terrestrial planet's interior, uh, interior heat has very little effect on the surface temperatures, so sunlight is the only significant energy source for the surface. Therefore, without the greenhouse effect, a planet's average surface temperature depends only on two things. The planet's distance from the sun, which determines how much energy is received from sunlight. Uh, in general, the closer a planet is to the sun, the greater the intensity of incoming sunlight. And two, the planet's overall reflectivity, which determines the relative proportions of incoming sunlight that happens to be reflected back or absorbed by the surface. The higher the reflectivity, the less light absorbed and the cooler the planet. So how can we apply this? Well, let's take a look at our neighbors. Both distance from the Sun and reflectivity have been measured for all of the terrestrial planets, that is, Mercury, Venus, Earth, we include the Moon, and Mars. 
With a little mathematics, these measurements can be used to calculate the, quote, no greenhouse temperature that each world would have if it did not have any greenhouse effect. This table shows the results. The, quote, no greenhouse temperatures for Mercury and the Moon lie between their actual day and night temperatures. That's just because they have pretty much no atmosphere and hence no greenhouse effect. So imagining it without one is not really changing anything. But Mars, on the other hand, does have a weak greenhouse effect that makes its global average temperatures only about 6 degrees Celsius higher than its non-greenhouse temperature. But what we're going to focus on is the comparison between Venus and the Earth. Venus is the extreme case. With a greenhouse effect that bakes its surface to a temperature more than 500 degrees Celsius, it would, uh, er, 500 degrees Celsius warmer than it would be otherwise. We can also see why the greenhouse effect is so important to life on Earth. Without the greenhouse effect, our planet's global average temperature would be a chilly negative 16 degrees Celsius or 3 degrees Fahrenheit, which is well below the freezing point of water. With it, the global average temperature is about 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. That is 31 degrees Celsius warmer than the no greenhouse effect temperature. So the greenhouse effect clearly matters. Uh, for Earth, it's the difference between not having any liquid water and having it today. And on Venus, it's a difference of almost 500 degrees Celsius. So the greenhouse effect is important. So let's use this idea of comparing us to Venus to help us better understand ourselves. Sometimes we study the planets individually. For example, when we map the geography of Mars or the atmospheric structure of Jupiter. Other times, we compare the worlds to one another, seeking to understand similarities and differences. This latter approach is called comparative planetology. Note that uh, astronomers use the term planetology broadly to include moons, asteroids, and comets as well as the planets. The essence of comparative planetology lies in the idea that we can learn more about an individual world, including our own Earth, by studying it in the context of other objects in our solar system. It is much like learning more about a person by getting to know his or her family, friends, and culture. Both Earth and Venus formed from the same materials, and generally in the same way. Despite this, however, their atmospheres came to be profoundly different. In exploring these differences, we come to learn of some of the rather important lessons about our own atmosphere. So let's take a look at the atmosphere of Venus. I'm just going to bring all these up and let's see. Hopefully I don't go too far. I did. There we go. Okay. So our most important lesson, however, comes from Venus. Venus presents a stark contrast to other planets, and it's easy to understand why. Its larger size allows it to retain a lot of interior heat, leading it to greater volcanism. And the associated outgassing from those volcanoes released a vast quantity of carbon dioxide that creates its strong greenhouse effect. But it becomes more mysterious when we compare it to the Earth. Because Venus and Earth are so similar in size, we might naively expect that both planets have a similar atmospheric history. Clearly, however, this is not the case. So in the rest of this portion of the lecture, we're going to explore how Venus's atmosphere ended up so different from Earth's, and in the process, we're going to learn an important lesson about the hab uh, habitability of our own planet. If you, stood on, excuse me, if you stood on the surface of Venus, you'd feel a searing heat hotter than that of a self-cleaning oven, and a tremendous pressure 90 times greater than that on the Earth. A deep-sea diver would have to go nearly 0.6 miles beneath the ocean surface on Earth to feel a comparable pressure. Venus's atmosphere consists almost entirely of carbon dioxide. It has virtually no molecular oxygen, so you could not breathe the air even if you cooled it to a comfortable temperature. Moving through the thick air near Venus's surface would feel like a cross between swimming and flying. Its density is about 10% that of water. Looking upward, you would see a perpetually overcast sky, with only weak sunlight filtering through the thick clouds above. Because the thick atmosphere scatters nearly all of the blue light away, the dimly lit sky will appear reddish and orange in color. The weather forecasts for the surface of Venus today, and every day, is actually quite dull. 
Venus's slow rotation, that is 243 Earth days, means that it has a very weak Coriolis effect, and as a result, Venus has little wind on its surface and never has any hurricane-like storms. The top wind speeds measured by the Soviet Union's uh, Venera landers were only about 4 miles per hour. No rain falls because droplets that uh, form and fall from the cool upper atmosphere evaporate long before reaching the ground. The thick atmosphere makes atmospheric circulations so efficient at transporting heat from the equator to the poles that the surface temperature is virtually the same everywhere. The poles are no cooler than the equator, and night is just as searingly hot as day. Moreover, Venus has no seasons because it has virtually no axis tilt, so temperatures are basically the same all year round and everywhere on the surface. The weather is much more interesting at high altitudes. Strong convection drives hot air upward, high into the troposphere, where the temperature is 400 degrees Celsius cooler than it is on the surface. Sulfuric acid condenses into droplets that create Venus's bright reflective clouds. The droplets sometimes fall through the upper troposphere as sulfuric acid rain, but they evaporate at least 30 kilometers above the surface. So, uh, last thing to mention here is that the composite image that you see on the right is from the Venus Express spacecraft, and it combines a visible wavelength image, so that just what you would see with your own eyes, which is on the left, shaded in red, and an infrared image of the night side, on blue. Venus's south pole lies at the center. At most wavelengths, clouds completely prevent any view of the surface. The only way to really see the surface is to go there, and that's not exactly an easy feat. So, here's a bunch of really good questions that we have to ask. It's tempting to attribute Venus's high surface temperature solely to the fact that Venus is closer to the, uh, uh, is closer to the Sun than the Earth is. But Venus would actually be quite cold without its strong greenhouse effect, because its bright clouds reflect much more sunlight than Earth. The real question is why Venus has such a strong greenhouse effect. The simple answer is that Venus has a huge amount of carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, nearly 200 times that is Earth's surface. So, why is Venus warm? Well, because of the greenhouse effect. Okay, well, why does it have a strong greenhouse effect? Well, that's because of all the CO2 in its atmosphere blocking out the light and keeping the heat in. So, a deeper question still remains, however. Given their similar sizes and compositions, we expect Earth and Venus to have similar levels of volcanic outgassing, that is, gases being put out into its atmosphere when it was forming. And then, released gases have ought to have had the same compositions as well. So, why then is Venus's atmosphere so different from Earth's? So, they're the same size, they formed in the same way, they're not terribly far away from the Sun in terms of a difference, and they should have had the same outgassing, so what's so different? Well, we expect that huge amounts of water vapor and carbon dioxide should have been outgassed into the atmospheres on both Earth and Venus. Venus's atmosphere does indeed have an enormous amount of carbon dioxide, but it has virtually no water. Earth's atmosphere has very little of either. So we conclude that Venus must have somehow lost its outgassed water. So, while Earth lost both water vapor and carbon dioxide, so here's the question then. How are these gases lost? So we know now that the big difference between these two planets is the fact that one lost water. How did this happen? That sets up the rest of our discussion. We can easily account for the missing gases on Earth. The huge amounts of water vapor released into our atmosphere condensed into rain, forming our oceans. In other words, the water is still technically here, but it's mostly in a liquid rather than a gaseous form. The huge amounts of carbon dioxide released into our atmosphere is also still here. It's in the solid form, however. Carbon dioxide readily dissolves in water, where it can undergo chemical reactions to make carbonate rocks such as limestone. Earth has about 170,000 times as much carbon dioxide locked up in rocks than it does in its atmosphere. Which means that Earth does indeed have almost as much total carbon dioxide as Venus does. 
Of course, the fact that Earth's carbon dioxide is mostly in rocks rather than the atmosphere makes all the difference in the world. If this carbon dioxide were to somehow enter our atmosphere, our planet would be nearly as hot as Venus and would certainly be uninhabitable. So the main idea here is that we formed oceans, that ocean uh, or any body of water was able to take a lot of that carbon dioxide out of the air. And so that reduced the greenhouse effect. So we are left then with the question of what happened to Venus's water. Venus today is incredibly dry. It is far too hot to have any liquid water or ice on its surface. It is, e it is even too hot for water to be chemically bound in surface rock. And any water deeper in the crust or mantle was probably baked out long ago. Measurements also show very little water in the atmosphere. Overall, the total amount of water on Venus is about 10,000 times smaller than the total amount on Earth, a fact that explains why Venus retains so much carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. Without oceans, carbon dioxide cannot dissolve or become locked away in carbonate rocks. If it is true that a huge amount of water was outcast on Venus, it has somehow disappeared. The leading hypothesis for this disappearance of Venus's water invokes one of the same processes thought to have removed water from Mars. Ultraviolet light from the Sun broke apart water molecules in Venus's atmosphere. The hydrogen atoms that escaped to space through thermal escape, ensuring that the water molecules could never reform. The oxygen from the water molecules was lost to a combination of chemical reactions with the surface rocks and stripping away by solar winds. Venus's lack of a magnetic field leaves its atmosphere vulnerable to solar wind. Of course, Venus could have lost all this water only if it had been in the atmosphere as water vapor, where ultraviolet light could break the molecules apart rather than in a liquid ocean like the water on Earth. So our quest to understand Venus's high temperature therefore leads to one final question. Why didn't Venus like Earth, end up with oceans to trap its carbon dioxide in rocks and prevent it from being lost into space. To understand why Venus does not have oceans, we need to consider the role of feedback processes. That is, processes in which a change in one property amplifies, that is, a positive feedback, or counteracts, a negative feedback, the behavior of the rest of the system. With the idea of feedback in mind, let's consider what would happen if we could magically move Earth to the orbit of Venus. The greater intensity of sunlight would almost immediately raise Earth's global temperature by about 30 degrees Celsius, from its current 15 degrees Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius, or 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Although this is still well below the boiling point of water, the high temperature would lead to increased rates of evaporation from our oceans. The higher temperatures would also allow the atmosphere to hold more water vapor. The combination of more evaporation and a greater atmospheric capacity for water vapor would substantially increase the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Now remember, water vapor, just like carbon dioxide, is a greenhouse gas. The added water vapor would therefore strengthen the greenhouse effect and drive the temperatures a little bit higher. Well, this increase in temperatures would in turn lead to even more ocean evaporation and more water vapor in the atmosphere, which would further strengthen the greenhouse effect. In other words, we'd have a positive feedback process in which every little bit of additional water vapor in the atmosphere would lead to higher and higher temperatures and even more water vapor. So this process would rapidly spin out of control, resulting in what we call a runaway greenhouse effect. The runaway greenhouse effect would cause Earth to heat up until the oceans were completely evaporated and the carbonate rocks had released all of their carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. By the time the runaway process was complete, temperatures on our, quote, moved Earth would be even higher than they are on Venus today, thanks to the combination of uh, greenhouse effects of carbon dioxide and water vapor in the atmosphere. The water vapor would then gradually disappear as ultraviolet light came in to break apart the water molecules. The hydrogen would escape back into space. So, in short, moving Earth to Venus's orbit would essentially turn our planet into another Venus. So we have arrived at a simple explanation of why Venus is so much hotter than Earth. 
Even though Venus is only 30% closer to the Sun than Earth is, this difference was critical. On Earth, it was cool enough for water to rain down and make our oceans. The oceans dissolved carbon dioxide in chemical reactions and locked it away in carbonate rocks, leaving our atmosphere with only enough greenhouse gases to make our planet pleasantly warm. On Venus, however, the greater intensity of sunlight made it just as warm, or excuse me, made it just warm enough that the oceans either never formed or soon evaporated, leaving Venus with a thick atmosphere full of greenhouse gases. So that brings us to the end of our first part of this lecture and the first of three very important takeaways. I think that each of these three takeaways, well, when you put them together, is very solid uh, proof for climate change. And I, th I hope you can understand uh, each of these three points. So here's our first one. With what we have covered so far, we can see that the greenhouse effect is a simple and well understood scientific model. We can be confident in our understanding of it because it so successfully explains the observed temperatures of other planets. Given this model, there is no doubt that a rising concentration of greenhouse gases would make our planet warm up more than it would otherwise. The only debate, perhaps, is about how soon and by how much. So that's the end of part one. As always, thanks for watching and have a great day.